Hello everybody and welcome to Fashion Question Time. Fashion Question Time originated in the Houses of Parliament where it was hosted for several years by Mary Cray who we're delighted to have on our panel today. And then last year we moved to the v &A, so that and this year with the shift online we're really happy that even more people are able to attend Fashion Question Time. So I'd like to start by thanking Edwina Ehrman and the V&A for continuing to collaborate with us again today. I'd also like to thank Baroness Lola Young of Hornsey, who's the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Ethics and Sustainability in Fashion, for chairing Fashion Question Time today, and all of our amazing panellists who will be introduced by her shortly. Also, thank you to Sienna and Orsler for organising the event this year and to Sam for tech support and Emily and Bronwyn for design assets and promotion. Um, this is our first time live streaming an event like this, so please do bear with us if there are any glitches. So this year's theme is mass consumption, the end of an era. Orsula selected this title several months ago, well before we knew what the impact of this pandemic would be. The world we are living in now has been uprooted and transformed. We're not living the same lives as we did even a month ago. The fashion industry is now at a crisis point, economically, socially and environmentally. And this coronavirus pandemic has brought to light the systemic problems within the industry and revealed in a way just how fragile the system really is. We've witnessed decades of brands chasing ever cheaper production and factories around the world operating on impossibly tight margins. Consequently, workers' wages and workers' rights have been squeezed. It's seven years today since the Rana Plaza factory complex collapsed in Bangladesh and almost seven years since fashion revolution was born. And today, the struggle for human dignity in the fashion industry remains constant and costly. And today, too, the industry is out of balance with nature. Last month, I was in a completely different kind of isolation. I was sailing over 2,000 miles from the Galapagos to Easter Island. Easter Island, otherwise known as Rapa Nui, is also known as the loneliest island in the world. And I joined X Expedition as part of a circumnavigation of the world with an all-female multidisciplinary crew to carry out research into the devastating environmental impacts of plastics and toxics in our ocean. And as we entered the South Pacific Gyre in one of the remotest areas of the Pacific Ocean, we spent our days dropping the manta crawl to, to collect samples from the um, surface water, the niskin bottle to collect water from the water column, and the sea looked pristine within the gyre. I mean, it was so calm, so blue, you could see the Niskin bottle going down for metres and metres, but trawl after trawl brought up large quantities of plastics. And we know that an estimated 35% of all ocean microplastic pollution originates from textiles. And there in the middle of the ocean, I confronted the signs and symbols of our consumption across the Pacific seascape. I witnessed the reflection of our age of excess in the surface of the sea, in the trail of plastic waste, which has been left in the wake of uncontrolled growth. So our challenge this decade is to move beyond our currently destructive and Western worldview, which is tipping us into a climate catastrophe and a plastic pollution crisis towards a fashion industry which integrates nature in a truly sustainable way. We need brands and retailers to move from competitiveness towards collaboration, and we need to move from the commodification of natural resources to working alongside nature in all of her diversity in a way that's respectful, um, renewable and regenerative. And we also need to start to look at longer lasting, long -lasting value systems than profit, prioritising instead the protection of our ecosystems and the well-being of our workers and communities.
and the citizens who have lost touch with the reality of living in mutual nurture and independence with the natural world, we need to rebuild our connections with how our textiles and our clothing is made in the slow way, in balance with plants, animals, with the earth and with our oceans. In Mandarin, the word crisis is composed of two Chinese characters. One signifies danger and the other signifies opportunity. And there is a pathway through this crisis towards a different future. The question remains, will we all be brave enough to embrace this opportunity and start to create the revolutionary change which the fashion industry so desperately needs to see? So thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Baroness Lola Young, who is going to chair the panel today. Many thanks, Carrie, and thanks to everybody who's listening in. I hope you're all safe and well. Um, we've got, as you might imagine, a, a number of questions um, from a, a wide range of people, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to introduce you to the members of the panel, or rather ask them to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with asking um, Kate Fletcher if she would just say a little bit about herself. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name's Kate Fletcher. I'm professor at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion, London College of Fashion in the UK. I've written nine books uh, about fashion sustainability, which have been translated into seven languages, the latest of which is called Earth Logic, which I've written or co-written with my longtime collaborator, Matilda Tam. So the Centre for Sustainable Fashion that I work within has long worked with Baroness Young and the APPGs, including on the theme of consumption. And I look forward to talking with you today. Thanks very much, Kate. I think we can drop the title for today. Um, I'm going to move now to ask Dio, Dio Kurosawa, to say a little bit about himself from Amsterdam. Hi, right, thank you very much, uh, Lola. Uh, I'm Dio Kurosawa. I'm one of the founding partners of a company called The Bear Scouts. We basically work with brands, retailers, as well as, most importantly, the supply chain to make responsible fashion. Um, and, and, and we work with, a, a, as well, a great deal of uh, NGOs, uh, as well as um, different organizations that champion responsible fashion. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, um, a long time um, colleague from the Houses of Parliament, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm Lisa Cameron and I'm the MP for East Kilbride, Straven and Les Mahigo. So welcome from Scotland today to everybody as well. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I chair the textile and fashion all party parliamentary group in the House of Commons. I also have a real interest in uh, climate change, climate justice. Um, and when I joined the Commons in 2015, after being elected for the first time, I was the climate justice spokesperson for the party, looking at issues of climate change and justice for those communities in developing countries um, who are affected the most. So I'm really, really pleased to be here today and to join everyone else on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I move now to Mary, who many of you will be familiar with, but Mary, please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Mary Gray. I was the MP for Wakefield for 15 years. I served for five years in the shadow cabinet um, um, in various roles like um, shadow environment secretary and shadow secretary of state for international development, which is where my contact with fashion revolution began um, in terms of hosting the first, um, that very first conference, I think it was back in 2014. Um, and as chair of the environmental audit committee from 2016 until uh, the end of last year um, I audited government on its approach to sustainable development and um, sort of sustainability but I also um, did a series I, we, as the committee we conducted a series of about 20 inquiries looking at subjects as varied as single-use plastics microbeads um, the healthy oceans that Carrie was talking about earlier but also um, a, a big report into fast fashion which was really the first time that legislators had looked to try and 
and see um, just how damaging fashion is to the environment and try to put out there some uh, solutions um, that we thought would help government consumers um, and the general citizen to, to reduce their uh, footprint. Now, I, I lost my seat in the December election, so I'm uh, sitting at home in my attic um, with the neighbour's dogs barking. I hope that wasn't too uh, annoying. Um, and thinking about how I can use the skills that I've learned to apply them um, out uh, with businesses and uh, charities. Thank you very much, Mary. And finally, um, you, Kenya, have the last word. Hi, um, hi, my name is Kenya Honda. I'm fashion director at Grazia. Uh, and prior to that, I um, was at Elle, um, as deputy editor. I've worked for a range of women's magazines um, and titles before that. And um, I am not an expert by any means. I'm just someone who's uh, quite passionate about climate change and um, th the role uh, that we have in the fashion industry and in contributing to that. Um, I think I'd say that parenthood actually really sort of uh, accelerated a sense of urgency with me in terms of really thinking through how my own um, habits are taking a toll on the planet. And what I do as an editor is I try to, to take um, a, what is essentially a very complex and, and big problem and make it easier for um, readers to understand. And I just want to use the platform that I have to help them to really think through their habits and think through their wardrobe building differently and to really see how climate crisis can, can impact their everyday lives. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be here and it's great to meet you all. Thank you very much, Kenya. And uh, I, for one, am very gratified to have such a wide range of um, expertise, experience, skills and, and knowledge around the metaphorical uh, table to um, discuss this and address these questions. Now, as you might imagine, um, uh, the pandemic uh, kind of rears it, it, its ugly head, as it were, um, throughout, is threaded throughout a number of these questions, not exclusively, but it obviously is a key point. So um, I'm going to kick off with the first question, um, which is from Edwina Ehrman, who's the senior curator at the VMA. And Edwina asks, in the Times, uh, Richard Hyman, independent retail analyst, wrote, 85 to 90% of clothing purchases are wants, not needs. Clothing is the most discretionary purchase of all. Consumers will emerge from all of, it, all of this having survived without refreshing their wardrobes. This will be a profound influence on future demand. So that's the quotation from Richard Hyman. And Edwina asks, is he right? Is there going to be less demand? And I'm going to ask, I think, Kenya to, to start off um, and, and try and address this particular uh, question. So over to you, Kenya. Yes, I mean, I think we're already seeing a change in demand. And I think that largely boils down to the economy, which is in a state of free fall. Um, you know, I read that 75% of consumers in Europe and, and uh, the States um, believe that their personal finances are being negatively impacted by this pandemic. So that alone is, is impacting demand. Um, and then on top of that, we were sort of seeing a gradual shift and mindset with uh, consumers in general as awareness spreads of how you know overconsumption has a negative toll on the planet. So I think those two combined things were um, are definitely playing a part. And we know you know following the Great Recession and 9/11 uh, and SARS, we we know you know history shows us that there was a, a reduction in, in demand for fashion. That said, I just read this morning that in China, quite a few luxury brands are showing growth, um, have reported growth over the past three weeks. So I think, um, you know, the, the story changes day by day, hour by hour. So I think we just have to wait and see. But what we do know is that the economy is not in a great place and that unemployment is spiking. So we're sure to see um, a, a reduction in demand for sure. Thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna pass over to you, Mary, and sort of add a little bit by saying, I mean, it, it feels like we're in a context that is so difficult to predict what's going to happen. Do you think it's possible to make a statement um, that is definitive in that way? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I wanted to go back to wants, not needs. And um, as Kenya says, um, fashion is a discretionary item, but we do actually all need to wear clothes. And I was volunteering at my local food bank um, on Wednesday and the first thing that I was told were, when I went in was I had to get this face mask on so that we weren't spreading um, 
potentially the virus onto the food parcels that we were giving out to people who are either sheltering or vulnerable. So this is now what we need, you know, forget about all the things that you want. And I want loads of things, trust me. Um, I, you know, I feel like a pent up um, demand is building in me and I want to get back to normality. But this, which matched the black and white uh, that I was wearing, it was color coordinated, you'll be pleased to know, is just a tiny little bit of homemade fabric, um, a little bit of some sort of scrappy t-shirt, which is really quite, quite horrible, but perfectly functional with a little um, pocket at the top where you could put some kitchen roll in so you have a double barrier. Take it home, wash it at 60, you're good to go. So what we want and what we need are gonna be two different things. And I think there's a radical change coming. Um, we've seen collapses in sales and I'm sure China is seeing um, a luxury boom, but that's because no, nobody's bought anything there for three months. So what happens when the sort of pent up demand, the people who want those handbags or want those top items, what happens when they have stopped buying those things, they've got what they want. What's clear is there's a collapse in sales, absolute collapse. We're going to see companies going to the wall. Warehouse and Oasis have already, and Kath Kidson and Laura Ashley have already gone into administration. So the size of the industry will be smaller. The high street will shrink. Um, we're seeing difficulties in deliveries. Um, I'm getting stuff that I bought a month ago being delivered by Royal Mail four weeks later, and that's in cent central London. So I don't know what it's like anywhere else in the country. And I've got people emailing me on my old parliamentary account saying, why am I an essential worker when I'm packing ice cream? Um, you know, why is ice cream essential? Why am I risking my health working in the, a store in, um, in a delivery warehouse? What's essential? And I think people are, are questioning in themselves, you know, the work that they do. So I think what we're also doing is sitting around thinking, what are our workloads? Because none of them, none of us have worn them for a month. So I've got a, I've got a, wardrobe full of jackets um i've got a, you know we've got a wardrobe full of high heels well some of us um and tight dresses but you know we're not sitting here in our high heels and tight dresses because when we leave and go for our walk outside we'll be having flat trainers comfortable um shirts um easy to wash things that we don't have to take to the dry cleaners so i think we're redefining what fashion is and i think people are, are also you know just thinking oh well I'll, if it's not in the wash this week i can't be bothered looking at all the other stuff i've got and there'll come a point where six months will go by and we won't have worn a lot of our wardrobe. I mean, obviously there's winter clothes, summer clothes. And I think, what will future demand look like? We're going to see, you know, we've had a, about a million people sign on for universal credit, an explosion in debt, in hardship, in non-payment of rent, in defaults on loans. So demand will be absolutely on its knees, I think. Once the massive sale of all the backstock has happened, and I'm not sure how you do a massive sale when you're socially distancing, we're going to see cheap oil. That will mean that fabrics are cheaper. But we're also going to see some of the workforce won't come back. Now, some of the workforce won't come back here in the UK and in the global north, but some of the workforce won't come back in the global south as well. And we're going to see disruption, I think, to the shipping industry. Um, so what we want and what we need will change. Um, we'll have to spend a lot more time making what we need and at the moment we need to repurpose our factories into making PPE and face masks and I don't mean proper PPE face masks I mean the sort of little little ones that I've got there and um, we're going to potentially I think see clothes becoming more expensive I think that's where it will land in the medium term in the short term there'll be a, a fire sale like you've never seen but once that's happened and the industry has right sized fashion 2.0 will be very different and I think the way we work and the clothes we wear to work all of the assumptions we have around the rules of uniform and the things that make us feel good will be changed completely after this very very interesting and um, a lot of what you've said and, and, and also what Kenya said relates to the, the next question that I have on my list which comes from Sarah Moa um, who's a fashion journalist and critic and Sarah says the pandemic has caused consumer degrowth overnight which is a main goal of the sustainability movement yet it simultaneously exposed, exposed the flaw in the ideal that deceleration is a disaster for the most vulnerable garment workers. 
Long term, what can be done to recompense and care for communities who may never work for the industry again? And this obviously is, is a key um, issue when we, in terms especially, but not exclusively of workers in, in the global south. So I'm going to ask um, Kate, Kate Fletcher, to start us off um, and try and address that question. What are we going to do for those communities? Should we do anything? Thanks, uh, Lola. Um, I, I'm really grateful actually to have the opportunity perhaps just to catch the language here and maybe to clear up some of the confusion because degrowth is not the same as negative growth and what we're experiencing at the moment is negative growth and I think it's really wholly wrong to assume that what is happening now in the fashion sector in any way gives us a foretaste of what will happen if we engage with degrowth growth ideas fully. So what growth is, is it's the process of accumulation of capital and wealth. And in it, the chief question that everyone asks is, is how can we grow? Whereas degrowth, by contrast, it's not an economic concept wholly. It really involves the whole of society. It asks questions about values and representations, and it's about examining consumption of natural resources and energy, but within the carrying capacity of the planet. So the planet and its ability to support our activity comes first, and then we figure out what fashion can be like within those limits. So the chief question that degrowth asks is, how can we live together and together with nature? And so it's a fundamentally different starting point. And I think it's really important to catch that. And I think maybe it's useful just to extend a little bit more the, the metaphor that Herman Daly offered to us in the 1980s. So he is one of the originators of um, the ideas that underpin the degrowth movement. He then called it steady state economics. And for me, anyway, he really helpfully contrasted the difference between growth and degrowth by saying, so growth economics is a bit like being in a plane, in an aeroplane, and it needs to be moving forward all the time. It can't stall in mid-flight because if it does, it just falls out of the sky. So this requires it to be continuously moving forward. And this, is, this condition is a feature of how the system, how the plane is designed. Degrowth is more like a helicopter, if you like. It can stay in one place, it hovers up and down, and it's the design of this, the, the active choice that is a completely different function that we are choosing purposefully to shape and frame work uh, and the choices that we make in a different way, which is important. And the ramifications are that people are central within the degrowth movement. What you see at the moment is because the, the system that we're engaged with is fundamentally flawed. So in, in other words, I mean, you, you're questioning that, um, how we sort of interpret that term degrowth. I suspect it will be one of those terms that gets mangled up in public discourse and becomes quite divorced from the more precise meaning uh, uh, that you were taking from that. But Lisa, if I can move on to, to, to Lisa, uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that um, there, there's a real issue about um, what, what happens to communities who've been working in this industry and relying on it economically? Absolutely. I, I think we've already been hearing that um, larger companies have um, gone into administration and therefore down the supply chain to those who, um, who don't make very much money at all already for such hard earned work that they do. Um, they're, they're going to be potentially the victims of, of you know, what happens in, in the industry in terms of the impact. Uh, and I think um, it's really important that we take responsibility um, in the West for, for um, what's happening to those workers in, in those countries uh, who rely upon um, their income, very low as it is, in order to sustain themselves and their families. So um, I've already written to the International Development Committee Chair to ask um, that they look at this issue and they look seriously at um, inquiring into what can be done in relation to our international aid budget to support um, those workers in, on the poverty line um, who you know, will, will then find themselves um, 
thrown into unemployment in areas of the country that don't have safety nets. I think um, the other issue that, that's come to mind is, as we've been trying to um, look at um, PPE for our own uh, frontline staff in the UK, is also the manufacturing industry that's been lost in the UK. Um, and it's really important, and I think it might be one of the issues going forward, that we look at our level of self-sustainability to some degree as well in terms of um, quality manufacturing in the UK and why that's actually important. Um, and I know that Fashion Revolution and um, many of the, the other um, parts of industry have been working really hard to look at manufacturing PPE in the UK on a large scale and, and you know, very, very quickly to support those frontline workers. So I think it throws up questions there too. Um, in terms of what should uh, we be doing in the UK to promote skills um, in the garment industry, in fashion, and making sure um, that we also develop, develop skills where it's needed and, and it, that it's not always seen um, that everything should uh, be imported based upon cost and low wages. So there are, there are massive global issues to consider in terms of appropriate wages for those workers internationally and um, how we will attempt to support them in potential poverty at this point in time, um, you know, globally and internationally. But there's also issues for the UK in terms of uh, the fashion industry to take forward, which have been thrown into a sphere now where we're, we're looking at trying to address some of those. Um, and I think, you know, that might be something that, that moves forward um, progressively as a result. Um, the, the other thing I'd say about people's changing patterns of behaviour is that we need, really need to have a, a cultural change as well in terms of not thinking that, that we should have so many things, but looking perhaps at quality and design and, and sustainability and, and trying to educate young, young people now and generations that it's not all about mass consumption and having lots of things at your fingertips as soon as, as you order them. It's, it's about having particular pieces and, and fashion um, sense should develop in, in that way. So, so I think there's lots of work to be done at governmental level, but also at a cultural level and um, internationally in order to tackle the issues that have arisen. Thank you, Lisa. It really, I think what you've shown is it how it, it cuts across so many different areas, politics, economics, business practice, cultural practice. And that, that fits um, uh, very much with, with another question that I've got here in front of me from Celine Seaman, who is the founder of Slow Factory. And Celine asks, with the fashion industry convinced that product is king and relying heavily on consumption, um, or shall we be blunt here, overconsumption? Sorry, let me start that reading that again. I've misread that. With the fashion industry convinced that product is king and relying heavily on consumption, or shall we be blunt here and say overconsumption rooted in insecurity, how can we reconcile a business model dependent on endless consumption with waste? And I think here, you know, we're going to retread some of the um, um, issues that have already been raised which point to a real fundamental change in how we think about things. So I'm very interested to hear, first of all, from you, Dio, how do you think we can address this issue? It kind of does relate back to this difference between wants and needs, as well as what we mean by degrowth and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you know, from our perspective, we are basically feed on the ground. I mean, we're... Uh, before the, the outbreak, uh, I'm traveling just January and February, um, 10 different flights uh, in January, 10 different flights in February, visiting factories and working with them to figure out, you know, how they're making product, if they're making product in the right way, the materials that they're using, et cetera. But I guess the question that it's asked is really more about the system in which we're working in or we living that we're living by. I mean, this is about capitalism to some, to some extent. And I think it's very key to note that she said that this is rooted in insecurity. Yes, it's, it's, it's in fact correct. I mean, we don't need to buy all the things that we do buy, but in fact, uh, you know, these businesses have been set up in order to address, you know, overconsumption. You know, H&M is not the business that started in 1970s. This is a very old business. Um, the, the food industry is very much the same, you know, as the fashion industry. It's about 
you know, providing, I mean, I think in, in Celine's home country, uh, there's, there's stores called um, Costco or you know, these really value market places where you buy bulk products that you don't in fact need. But I think the real answer to this is really innovation. It's about how things are made. Are they adopting circular uh, methods? Are they, uh, you know, is the material that's used, is it something that goes back into, you know, the, the supply chain? Um, the other thing is that brands don't look at their supply chain as partners. You hear that mentioned a lot, but a lot of my manufacturing clients, they, you know, they've, they've been left in the dark by Arcadia Group, for example, who's left one of my manufacturers with a bill of around 400,000 pounds on canceled orders. If they're truly a partner, then they would be innovating together. There's loads of innovations out there, but the, the model that's set up is not made for the, the, the brand to get a, take a hit on their margin in order to you know, benefit the environment. So I think we have to go back and look at, you know, what, is, what are we trying to accomplish here? If we're trying to accomplish you know, an, a better environmental stance, then we have to rethink how we're, our models are. You know, I'm not saying that we need to throw away capitalism. I don't think that's going to happen. I also don't really strongly believe that consumer behavior is going to shift all that drastically without incentives. And the incentives that I like to see are the things that Fashion Revolution is doing, like um, the, the, the designer swap, you know, swapping clothes instead of using monetary uh, funds to, to purchase new, new garments. Um, you know, the recycling, uh, you know, using circular means, you know, there, there are things available, um, but they cost money. And if these brands or retailers are interested in moving that in that direction, they need to have incentives in order to do so. They're not just going to do it because we tell them to. Okay, that, that's interesting. That whole issue of uh, incentives is, is a, also a bit of a political hot potato. But I'm going to ask Kate, um, we're coming back to this issue of um, overconsumption, insecurity, waste. What's your view on that? question how can we reconcile or can we indeed reconcile this business model that we currently have and and our environmental needs yeah no thank you yeah the um it, it seems doesn't it that the fashion industry has has been set up to somehow make us uh, spend money we we don't have uh, on things we don't need to impress people we don't much care about and so as we're going forward perhaps it is important for us to to recognize that the business model that underpins uh, the current fashion sector is, is based on a logic of economic growth. Um, and other logics, other business models are available. It's not the only one, we created it, we can create something else. And in fact, um, we need business as part of a, a solution moving forward. Frequently, I think people are is struggling to find where to place innovation, where to place business in the, in the wealth of activity that we're going to engage with, perhaps post COVID-19 or generally just as we engage with the crisis of climate change in the fashion sector. And we see that business is an important part of long-term healthy futures. Perhaps it won't be the major dominant force that it has been, but it will become one of many activities. Um, I think it's called a pluriverse of, of activities. And it will really begin to contribute in many ways and sit alongside other things. Perhaps the reason that we really need to sort of hold uh, onto a more, um, a conversation about logic, about system and other things is that we realize at the moment for more than 20 years, many of us have been really working to drive change in the fashion, fashion sector. And unfortunately, the change that we have been delivering is completely outpaced by the, at the size, the aggregate size of the industry growing year on year. And it's simply not strong enough, not deep enough, the change that we're engaging with to actually radically make a difference. So it is important that we keep holding on to the conversation around growth, absolutely, but also about different ways that we can organise this, because they do exist. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to come to you um, straight away after the, the next question. So, um, and here it is, it, it's from Catherine Teton, who is the Creative Director at Teton Jones. And Catherine asks, what is currently being done to educate the next generation of mass consumers ages 8 to 13? 
and what should be done to educate, oh, right, okay, that kind of, uh, on what should be done to educate the next generation of mass consumers. So it's about what is currently being done and what we should be doing um, uh, to educate the next uh, generation. Let's not call them consumers just yet, but, but about to be consumers. So yes, Kate, I'm gonna to come to you as obviously you're involved very deeply in education. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I also, um, I have two sons, they're just slightly older than that uh, eight to 13 age category. So I'm based in the UK and I suppose um, maybe what it seems like is the education of this group uh, is really mainly currently handled by the marketing departments of brands. And this is really shocking, isn't it? Because we see that this is the information that they're getting and this is a worrying factor and certainly to pick up on the thread from the last point the economic growth focus that's so prevalent in society means that consumption really isn't critically considered in schools and across curricula there isn't a coherent critique of what consumption practices mean in the school curriculum in the UK at all and this is um mm. This is, this is missing. Dio, is this something that you've observed as a, as a lack in the education? I mean, from a collegiate level, it's certainly there. Um, I lecture at the university here in Amsterdam and um, we see that, you know, the students are definitely grasping onto it, but of course they're not in that age group that you spoke of. Um, but that being said, I think it's about <laughs> by example, you know, I think you need to be the change that you're looking to see. Um, you know, you, you talk about brands having, you know, the marketeers at brands, you know, kind of aiming towards these groups. Um, but what can we do to ensure that those groups are getting the right picture? And, and, and what I mean by that is, um, if, if there's a great new drop of uh, a new game out, uh, the 8 to 13 year olds, they certainly know about it. But how can we partner with those folks to ensure that there, you know, a full spectrum uh, of knowledge is given that that it's not just what they would like to uh, push, but also what we would also like to push. So I think it's really about coming together um, and, and, and working with a variety of, you know, folks who may not be embracing responsible fashion or climate change, but maybe they have the, you know, the platform that we're trying to well, that, that prevails for that uh, demographic. I think we need to work together uh, across industries, in fact, in order to get this message across. Thank you. Um, Mary, you wanted to say something on this. I did. Um, so um, before the lockdown, I went and saw my mum who was clearing out her attic. And I'm not saying she keeps everything, but here is the Marks and Spencers packaging from my blouses when I went to high school, when I was 11 years old. And what I love about it is it's bilingual, so no Brexit here, uh, in 1979, chemise fillette. Um, and it was made in the UK. I don't know if you can see it there, but down at the bottom is made in the UK, a poly cotton blend made in the UK. Now that is something for the Marks and Spencers uh, Museum of Fashion, because I bet there aren't that many plastic bags that survive. Uh, 40 years but I also had my home economics book what is home economics and in uh, on the 7th of September my first day my first week at school I wrote my home economics is learning to cook for and feed a family and or husband <laughs> yes very <laughs> traditional how to sew properly so that simple things need not be bought and how to space out money so it will be at hand when it is needed to pay bills and rent there's my cross stitch this is week one of age 11 here are my three types of stitching, snake stitch, herringbone stitch, which I didn't even knew exist, and chain stitch. Here, three months later, is my design of my soft toy that I made. And then there's my uh, knitting bag. It was 70, it cost 75p to make. Now, I just say that because there's nothing new under the sun. And although games might be interesting and they might be a gateway to get young people into and thinking about it, a bit like the um, virtual hand raise, there's nothing like really seeing it in real life. And what I've noticed on my endless walks around the streets is that people that don't normally do stuff are starting to do weird things, like not weird things, but um, I've seen sort of men knitting and things like that and and I think this virus is an opportunity for us to sit at home and talk about 
how we learned and what we learned. And when we had our inquiry, we had um, a lecturer from Leeds College of Fashion who said, well, one of my students said, oh, I'm going to have to go and get a new coat because the buttons come off this one. And the fact that you've got fashion students, and I'm not saying this is universal, but it was, you know, it's an anecdote, it's not evidence, that can't sew on a button when 20 years earlier you had 11 year olds that could do blanket stitch on that bunny rabbit, chain stitch, and once you've made something and sweated over it for hours, you're much less likely to throw it out because you actually understand the making and creation that went into it. So I think there's something about the appreciation of craft that the next round of fashion and learning and understanding is going to we can get back to those days. I'm not saying, you know, that was when I could have gone to be a textile worker. So clearly you needed to know about sewing machines. If we're onshoring, as Lisa was talking about, you know, one of the difficulties we have is we've lost all the machinery. We've lost all those skills. Wakefield um, was one of the centers of the textile, carpet, bedding, heavy woolen industry. There was a, there's a collective memory there, but over the next 20 years, that memory will be gone. So if we are going to onshore, we need to go back to those older communities um, and traditional craft communities and start really valuing their knowledge and experience because once it's gone, it will be lost forever. Yes, I mean, I, I think that one can have um, uh, not, not exactly a, a more optimistic view, but, but certainly you can see that some of those changes in thinking are happening. However, I do remember having to try and explain what darning socks meant to a 20 year old. That, that was kind of difficult. OK, so our next question is um, from Caroline Lucas, who many of you will know as the Green MP for Brighton and former leader and co-leader of the Green Party in the UK. So the question is whether it's climate change, biodiversity loss or plastic pollution, fast fashion is speeding up environmental destruction around the world. Is it time fashion moved from overconsumption to sufficiency? And what could this look like for the industry, its textile workers and consumers? So I think there it's almost like a summary question of some of the issues that we've been discussing so far. So I'm going to come uh, first to uh, Dio and ask him if what he how he would like to comment on that, particularly perhaps to this issue around textile workers. Um, um, yes, yeah, so Dio, if you wouldn't mind uh, kicking off. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I don't think that was mine, but I don't. No, mind no problem. It. Whether it's climate change, biodiversity loss, or plastic pollution. Fast fashion is speeding up environmental destruction around the world. Is it time fashion moved from overconsumption to sufficiency? And what could this look like for the industry, its textile workers and consumers? And that's from Caroline Lucas, MP. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, fast fashion is not great. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the problem with um, synthetics and things like polyester, and obviously the oil prices dropping make that even more interesting for you know, those producing such things to, to tap into it. However, I think there's an economic issue that people don't really consider. If you consider India, if you consider China having disposable income for the first time. I think uh, Kenya uh, spoke earlier about how the luxury market has seen a boom uh, as China has returned back to business after uh, COVID. So, you know, how, how I think it's, it's about regulation in the fast fashion industry. Um, I also think by its own nature, this fast fashion industry is dying on its own. And it's, it's simply because, you know, you cannot, uh, you cannot stop paying rent, stop paying workers, you know, turn your back on your supply chain. Um, and then, you know, when things are bad and then expect them to stick around for you when things return back to normal, if they ever do. Um, so it's really about embracing, you know, quality over quantity. Um, and that can only happen when those who are having the ability to purchase things, um, if they make a, a better informed decision. Now, is that going to happen? You know, can we expect those in, 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 in emerging countries uh, who have disposable income for the first time to just, you know, take our words for it when we've spent decades <laughs> showing them the wrong way to do things with our disposable income? Um, so I really would look to you know regulating uh, or, or 
or the you know someone to regulate these uh, these these companies and, and their desire to you know overproduce. Thank you. And so, Mary, um, um, Dio has mentioned regulation and sort of implied legislation as well. What do you think is the what do you think of the possibility for this? And I know obviously you looked at this in, in the report from uh, the Environmental Audit Committee last year. Yeah, I mean, I think the real the difficulty with any form of regulation is this is an international business model, so it's very hard to regulate it just in um, one country. What we recommended was the extended producer responsibility scheme to tackle the end pipe of waste, the, the million tonnes of uh, textile waste that the UK produces every year and to try and stop um, the 300,000 tonnes going to landfill or incineration. Um, but I, first of all, I just want to say hi to Caroline and to thank her for um, her being an absolutely great colleague in the House of Commons and saying that I miss uh, all our time together on the Environmental Audit Committee if she's watching. Um, but also, um, back to the, the issue of um, biodiversity, I, I think I'm really worried about what's happening. We've had to postpone COP26 um the, the whole kind of global diplomacy around um climate change the biodiversity summit um has been cancelled in china and all the normal business of carbon reduction is is paused and on hold and po possibly for, for a year or more um so and we know that there's no herd immunity from climate change we know there's no vaccine and we know that there's no treatment so you know if this is bad, how much worse is, is climate change going to be um, for ourselves and our children? I do think the G20 presidency, which Italy is going to have next year, and the G7 presidency, which the UK is going to get next year, um, gives the two co-organisers of um, the COP26 conference a real chance to put climate and regulation onto the agenda. And I know that this is something um, that the OECD, as part of, you know, will feed into the, those um, G, G20 discussions, particularly around um, microplastics, because I was at um, a conference about it in Paris um, in February. Um, on the issue of workers, I think we are going to have to, again, go back to the future. Brands have um, cancelled orders. Some of them have paid for them, some of them haven't. Um, but brands are burning through their cash stockpiles and no business can keep going when it shops are shut, its workers aren't working and there's, there's no global trade. So, you know, this is an absolutely massive clunking fist in the face of every business on the planet. And I think we're gonna go back to basics. I think we're going to, taxpayers are gonna say, why are we giving um, Philip Green's Arcadia Group taxpayers money when he's chosen to locate his company for tax minimization purposes in Monaco? But ditto um, Richard Branson, ditto Starbucks. It's all about tax minimization. So why am I as a taxpayer paying for workers when they haven't paid their taxes here in this country. So that's the first thing. I think making sure that, you know, companies who have taken out and benefited from the furloughing scheme then start putting back in. There has to be some sort of reciprocity. So that's the first thing in this country. The second thing is brands don't want to see their garment workers in Myanmar and Bangladesh and China, um, you know, being an India being thrown into abject poverty and 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 suffering in the way that we've seen on, on the television I, I don't believe anybody in any company anywhere wants to see that so the question is how do brands in fashion 2.0 make deeper relationships they know their staff here in this country why can't they know their staff in in Bangladesh, in China, and why can't they look after them in the way that they look after their workers here? And if you go back to Salts Mill and Saltair or Bourneville for Cadbury's, you know, some of those great industrialists realised their workers were living in awful conditions and created model villages for them. And I think there's something there about knowing your workers better. Coronavirus means we're all going to have to have some sort of e-electronic tracing tagging whatever so that we've got our immunity passports or you know our health status and those checks are going to be global and they're going to be quite quick and we're seeing it in communist china we're going to see it through google we're going to see this happening that is 
you know, there's issues around human rights and about authoritarianism and repressive states, but there is also the potential for good to come out of that and for fashion supply chains to be shortened if brands want to do that. And I think that's where customers um, and consumers need to be demanding that change. Mm. So um, uh, thank you uh, very much for that. And I, uh, our next question is also about, comes back as it were to, to the consumer and overconsumption. So, oh, I beg your pardon, Kate. Oh, I see all these hands are uh, being Real life now. hands. Okay. okay, this is cool. So I'm gonna do Kate then uh sorry kenya did you have your hand up no lisa okay kate lisa and dio is that right okay then so uh kate um on to you over to you thank you um so just to think about what a shift from overconsumption might look like <clears throat> I think um, there are ideas out there already. So uh, recently together with my colleague Matilda Tan, we put together the EarthLogic Fashion Action Research Plan, which unfolds across six different, we call them landscapes, opportunities for what the fashion sector will be like when we begin to really fundamentally take uh, climate change seriously. So we describe it as earth logic because it replaces growth logic and it's like a paradigm shift, the beginning point of a whole new raft of opportunities for what fashion might be like. And we in there, we suggest loads of things, things that people can do practically today, um, working uh, in the different communities at all scales, business, individuals. And I think it's really important that we start to really fundamentally take on board the reality of climate change and work at pace because every action counts. There simply is no time to waste on this. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I think Lisa is next. Yeah. Yes, Lisa's oh, next. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I just want to add that I think um, if you're looking at mass consumption and we are um, working within the definition of, of capitalism internationally, I suppose, that a lot of it will go back to education uh, for young people. And I was really struck when um, I attended the Sustainable um, Fashion Summit in Copenhagen last year to hear that children in Denmark have the Sustainable Development Goals as part of their curriculum and that they can tell you all about them. They can link it um, to climate change. They can, they can link it to their daily lives and the government's policies on these issues. And I think it's such a good thing to have young people educated in terms of our global goals um, across the world so that, that we can um, really make sure that, that young people make informed choices. And the other thing that I was interested to see at the time was how technology can really bring those garment workers to life, so to speak, for consumers, in that there were some companies who had developed labels um, looking at how a garment was manufactured right back to the person um, who sewed it, where the, the material was made. And it really brought it to life in terms of here's the, here's the person who worked on it. Here's um, what they were paid. Here's um, the, you know, the level of support that they're given from the industry. And I think when people can access that information at their fingertips through their phone, people are going to start to make different choices and those different choices in themselves then start to shift culture and um, how we utilize fashion in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and, and Dio to you. Yeah, just quickly, uh, just to respond to the, the, the statement that was made about how difficult it is to regulate. It is difficult to regulate globally, but I guess the question is, why are we allowing, uh, let's say fast fashion brands from the West to produce in third world countries for a lower price. Obviously, it's, they're not in uh, Bangladesh, they're not in Cambodia, Vietnam, or in China because, because of the craftsmanship. 
I can tell you, I can take you to uh, European manufacturers, our clients who have robotic arms and uh, that, that produce clothing, that have on-demand manufacturing, that, that embrace blockchain. We just now have a new launch of a, a, a new innovation that allows you to feel the fabric of a garment just through your mobile phone. So there are a lot of innovations that are out there. The problem is fast fashion won't pay for it because the model that fast fashion is built on does not allow for such a thing. It's based on you spending little, having a big margin to sell, to get a profit. And until that shifts and until you can regulate at least the businesses within the UK who are going way over to the Far East in order to take advantage of these lower prices, then we're never really going to get anywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the following question has been addressed in, in, in some of your responses, but I do want to, um, I'll, actually what I'll do is go straight to Kenya after this question. She's been very patient waiting to, to make her contribution. So um, the, the next question is from Josie and Rich from the ADAPT Climate Club. And uh, it goes, even though it seems as though attitudes towards overconsumption are changing for the better, the skyrocketing orders for fast fashion websites during the COVID-19 pandemic prove otherwise. What do you think it will take to change the attitudes of both policymakers and consumers for the better? So that's from Josie and Rich. And if I could go straight across to Kenya and ask you to, to respond to that question, please. Yeah, so basically, I think, um, you know, again, I work on the B2C end of things. So I'm always speaking to the consumer um, at the magazine. And I think it's about um, just really constantly showing her how her habits and his habits really impact one's day to day life. So, for instance, you know, I was talking to this designer, Bethany Williams. Um, or rather, we, we, I recently published an interview with her, and um, I think she's been a real bright spot in all of this. And she was saying that if people knew that when you order multiple sizes and you keep one and you send the others back, that they're burnt, um, that they probably wouldn't do it. So, I mean, I think there's educating them essentially to the high cost, the very high cost of cheap clothing, number one. Um, which is a you know, discussion that's already been happening. But I think now that we are in this state of lockdown and isolation, we're really getting a really big taste of how our lives can change very quickly when, um, when things go wrong. And basically what we're going to see as a result of all this overconsumption and uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation around the impact of fast fashion on the planet and overconsumption and uh, sometimes it can just sound like theory. Uh, it's hard to really think through like what that means for your life on a day-to-day -day level. And that's when you really start to, to change your habits. Um, right now we're being forced to change our habits. We can't grocery shop as much. Um, someone mentioned earlier our clothing, we're only wearing a fraction of our clothing because our day-to-day -day lives have changed considerably. And that's when your habits really change. And so I think we just have to really think about it. I think that the goal for journalists like me, because we really play a part in changing the norm and changing culture, um, to borrow a phrase that I heard earlier, um, like we, we have to really show that consumer what this will mean for our day-to-day -day lives on, on a on a hour by hour, minute by minute sort of basis. I mean, we know that fast fashion, you know, um, the textile industry creates 1.2 billion tons of carbon emissions a year more than international aviation and shipping combined. It consumes lake size volumes of water. We know all those facts, but what does that mean? Um, like, how does that impact uh, her life day to day? So for me, I think it's those, those are the lessons. That's the education piece that really needs to happen to, to really impact the, the way that she views the boohoos and the pretty you know, little things and all those um, websites that she's going to to shop from currently. Um, you know, garment workers in Leicester are being paid like as little as three pounds per hour. Um, and that can seem quite distant. You know, we hear all these statistics and we hear all these facts and we can feel so removed from it. Um, and so I think we just have to really kind of draw those connections and bridge that gap um, that's clearly happening, that we're having a hard time closing in terms of the way that that everyday consumer really thinks through her habits and the inconvenience of it sometimes. Yeah, like, there, there's, there's a complication there. So, sorry, have you finished? Okay. Um, I, I was 
ask you a little bit um, uh, extra on that, actually, because yeah. it, it just struck me as you were speaking that as a fashion journalist, your role then is impacted by, um, uh, by how we change our habits or not. So for example, a lot of magazines, whether they're online or, 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 or physical, will be funded by advertisements for these some of these same companies that we're saying you know are, are, are damaging the environment so what does that mean in terms of how fashion journalists go about their business well it's it's really quite complicated and so i think those are conversations that happen uh offline and directly where you you have to in the same way that the consumer has to ask some tough tough questions of the of uh, the brands that she's shopping. I think as editors, we have to do the same thing. And those are the questions that are taking place. And we are a part of an eco a really complicated ecosystem. Um, so I go to press days, um, you know, where I will, where designers or, or publicists will talk me through their collections. And so that's when I'm asking the questions, you know, about their supply chain or the fabrics that have been used or um, where the clothing is being made. And so those questions, have, we have to ask those questions of them um, the same way that it's important for them to know that the consumer uh, wants to know where her clothing is made. It's really important for the journalist to make that known as well. And then there, there are really tricky questions and tricky questions being asked and conversations being had. But yes, you're right. It can be challenging when you work for a consumer magazine and then you have ads um, that are being placed by brands that aren't necessarily um, the most transparent or that don't necessarily have the most sustainable practices. Um, and then you have quite a few brands who want to make changes and don't know where to start or those who just um, aren't willing to, to, to make the investment needed to, to operate in a more sustainable way. So that, I mean, the, each conversation happens on a case by case basis. But for instance, um, you know, where I worked prior, we did a, a big sustainability issue. And that was really quite a tricky and complicated thing to do because we did have ads and in, in the magazine from brands who weren't the most sustainable at all. Um, but at the same time, you have to do something. Uh, we can't necessarily wait for everyone to be on board like these, you just have to start somewhere. Uh, and I think it's important to just have these conversations on a brand to, to brand level. Thank you very much for that. Lisa, would you like to add to this at all, especially around um, policymakers role? Yeah, I mean, we, we did speak a bit about how to make it um, more obvious to consumers, perhaps like a traffic light system of uh, sort of green, amber and red in relation to different aspects of manufacturing and um, support for garment workers and those types of issues. And I think there's some resistance, obviously, from um, the industry itself. So I think, you know, it's going to be a combination of um, shifting our education for young people to make sure that they understand the global goals, the sustainable development goals, why they're so important, combining that with um, some regulation, but the changing consumer patterns is going to be the main issue in terms of shifting. It has to be fashionable to be sustainable, in a sense, um, before we're going to shift this. And um, I think this blockchain system that I've been able to look at as well is going to be really helpful for people in terms of the technology of that, showing um, where it's come from, what you're buying, whether it's sustainable and giving people, because people are buying things and they don't know all of that. And it's quite convenient not to know it and not to know that it was Mary who made it in Bangladesh and was only paid, you know, two pence um, for this garment. Um, so, um, or, or a week even, I don't know. But the, 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 the story has to be there and it has to be visible to people. And I think when that comes together with the education, the technology and some aspects of policy making, that's when um, the industry itself will have to really get behind and, and shift because it will no longer be fashionable um, and they'll have to move with the times basically. Right, okay, thank you very much. Now, um, I'm just saying to um, Fashion Revolution colleagues, particularly Sienna, who's um, in charge of the questions, so I think uh, the next question I have on my list is from Gemma Finch. And I, I do think that a lot of the issues that almost 
probably all of the issues that have been covered in that question have actually been addressed by the panel. So um, her, her question was about um, cheap clothing and how we can collectively reconnect to the things that we're buying and reduce mass overconsumption. So I think we pretty much addressed um, uh, most of that, uh, the substance of that question. So if I may, I'd like to move on to uh, the question from Rebecca Don Donellan, if that's all right with everyone. And um, Rebecca is Director of Environmental Sustainability at Fossil. And Rebecca asks the question, there are lots of studies showing how consumers prefer more sustainable products and how they are willing to pay more. But does that intention really get met with action when it comes to fashion? Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask Kate to say something about that and then Lisa. Uh, that's a good so Kate. question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, um, but perhaps uh, Rebecca at Fossil can tell us maybe if she was here, whether it does actually translate. But I think what she's pointing to is what's frequently called the attitude behavior gap. So this difference between what people say they do and then actually end up doing. And actually, I think maybe what that begins to reflect the fact that it does exist, there is a void, people say all manner of things and then just do different things. It's that how hard it is actually to, to balance the needs that we all have, me now here, with a sense of our long-term security. How do we do this balancing act? And I think what it ends up pointing to is like questions about, you know, how do we want to live? What products do we need for a good life? And then we have to try to piece it together. But maybe when we think about figuring out this, this balance, um, the economic historian Avna Offer, he would say that what we need actually is to develop commitment strategies that support us into thinking about things long term. So historically, uh, these have been things like self-control and prudence but okay they make us all think oh my gosh that's not relevant today and indeed he says actually you know these things come in and out uh, we need to devise new ones things are, that are strong and that are going to work for these strange and wonderful times that we live in we need to think about commitment strategies that will work in the age of social media that will help people drive through to to link what they say they'll do with actually what they're going to do. We need commitment strategies that will help us think beyond the short term and that really are strong enough in the face of advertising and marketing budgets to help us really carry through on our commitments to climate change, biodiversity loss, and also our sense of ourselves as, as fashionable beings. Thank you very much. Lisa. Thinking back now to my days as a psychologist, actually, and, and how intention and behaviour doesn't always sort of follow through. Mm -hmm. But there's more a cycle of change than an actual we make a change and that's what we do forever. So we move in and out of change and, and we do a bit of what we think is right and then we revert back, lapse, I suppose you would call it, in, in the addiction field. And then we, we try to, um, to change again. And, and it takes a while to get to the maintenance phase where that change is embedded. So I think it's going to be over time that, that this happens in a sense. Um, but I think the other thing from psychology that, that's coming to my mind is that you have to try to make the sustainable change the easy option for people or the go-to option, or at least an option um, that's possible. Because if it's too expensive for people, then then the, they can't do it. Um, you know, they might want to, but they can't. Um, it's not feasible for them. So um, it, it's like the shift that you have in shops where you're trying to put things at the till. We know that people take things at the till. We're trying to make them healthier options. We have to try and, and shift and nudge people in the right direction. But, but part of that's going to be have to come from industry. Part of it's going to have to come from leadership in government, I think. Um, and yeah, it has to, to come together to, to make it possible for people. Thank you, Lisa. Um, now we're going to move on to a question from Jackie May, who is the founder at editor at t, um, twyg.com.za. And uh, Jackie asks, if fashion is not going to be morally dubious and irrelevant post COVID-19, 
how can it become constructive and contribute to social development and reduce its negative impact on the environment? How can we ensure it contributes to positive change? I think this is a really interesting, interesting question because it goes beyond saying, you know, do no harm and into actually being positive in terms of contribution uh, to society and communities. So I'm going to ask, first of all, Mary to think about how fashion can be a positive thing for us all. Well, I think there are two things. I think the first thing is it has to um, measure um, its environmental and energy uh, footprint. That's the first thing. And the government has introduced um, a new streamlined energy and carbon reporting framework, and it was due um, to be applied to 9,000 big businesses, um, FTSE uh, businesses and large companies in the UK for this reporting cycle, um, which is the kind of April company filing deadline. And of course, those company filing deadlines have all now been postponed for three months because auditors and accountants have to sign off accounts saying this company is a going concern, it has enough cash to meet its future requirements. And nobody knows what's a going concern anymore because you know unless you've got billions sitting on your balance sheet we don't know what will be a viable business in three months or six months time um some companies have gone ahead and, and done their reports so about a thousand companies were in scope of this energy reporting to begin with another nine thousand are going to be brought in and for me i think that's a game changer because once you say to companies Tell me about your carbon footprint in your shops, in your warehouses, in your um, mobile distribution networks. Um, measure the footprint of the travel to work of your employees. Then you start being able to compare and contrast. And it's a bit like the Fashion Revolution Transparency Index, which is another great way of measuring, ranking people. Now, of course, you know, companies that don't do well in the indices will always say, well, that's because you know, the, the data you chose is not what we're good at or we do it a different way. But basically, over time, people don't want to be bottom. And these 9,000 big companies, and there will be big fashion uh, and luxury retailers in there, will start moving and changing and wanting to be in the top quartile because that is what the board will want. But it is also because of some of the financial regulation that has ha happened as a result of the green finance work we did, um, you're gonna see investors moving away from high energy consumption um, and unsustainable business models. So investors are gonna say, hang on, I've got a duty to my um, future pensioners not to invest their monies in businesses that may go out of business in five or seven or 10 years time. And, and so the money will start to come out of those unsustainable businesses and go towards newer businesses and perhaps more sustainable models. And I think for me, that's the, we've talked about systems and regulations, but until you actually have government regulation that says, this is, the, this, is, this is how you do it. This is the rule. You can't be a company. You can't be on the stock exchange unless this, you meet this rule. Then, you know, we're not going to, um, we're not going to change behavior. So businesses will do what they're required to do by law. They will report their energy. They will also um, be thinking about how to deal with the virgin tax um, on plastic, on the tax on virgin plastics. Now that's due to come in in 2022. You know, it won't apply to textiles, but it'll make them think more about what they're selling in their shops and, and you know, how they're going to recycle plastics um, and put more recycled plastics into their products. So if we could get to the end waste of saying, you know, a penny for every garment or EPR, You've got a kind of holy trinity there of things that start to say, these are your energy inputs the, and environmental inputs. Uh, this is your waste tail, which we're trying to reduce. And this is your plastics um, consumption. And, and investors and, and consumers can then build up that rich picture of what sustainability looks like. I think there's too much to put onto the consumer um, of, you know, you've got to go into the weeds of, of looking at every brand that you've ever bought and thinking about whether they're good or evil. And this, the, and the moral, there is a huge moral uh, impetus on brands to do the right thing. And I think we know some of the very good ones, some of the very bad ones. The problem is most of them are somewhere in the middle and they're not incentivized to do the right thing. So I think we need to change the system of incentives and at a regulatory level, that change is coming in our job as citizens 
is to make sure that the, the virus crisis doesn't dilute uh, some of those very important uh, carbon decarbonisation changes. Thank you very much, Mary. I'm now going to ask um, Kenya to, to, to talk about this issue of, of, of how we can ensure, can we ensure that fashion contributes to positive change? Um, you know, I agree with much of what Mary said. I mean, I, I do think there is a lot of pressure placed on the consumer and it frankly can just be overwhelming to try to track down to, it, it's such a, a large topic. And so I think we can forget that, you know, th this, this woman who's like in the shops who just wants a dress that's gonna make her look good and feel good in the moment or, you know, that sort of thing. It's a lot to ask of her. And I do think a lot of this conversation does come down to regulation and policy for sure. Um, that said, um, you know, there's a lot of talk around big business. I, you know, I'd love to just sort of highlight what some of the, 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 the smaller, more independent and emerging designers are doing, because I think there's a lot that can be learned from, from that level and that sort of graduating class of um, designer and business, um, so to speak. So for instance, I, you know, I mentioned Bethany Williams, I think she's great because uh, she weaves charity into what she's doing. So she, each collection is produced with uh, a local charity group and the, a, lo a lot of the proceeds go back into that community. Or then there's um, Tebe Magugu, who's in South Africa. Again, you know, it's a, it's a very localized business. He's sort of scouring through the, the bins as they're locally known in Johannesburg. And then he's using the clothing uh, that he finds there, he upcycles it, um, and that money goes back into the community. He won the, he was the first African designer to win the LVMH prize last year. So there are a lot of bright spots happening because I feel like this conversation can really be quite down on fashion, but there are quite a lot of um, incredibly talented, innovative designers who are, who are, who have, uh, who are buildings, you know, small business that are, businesses that are worth looking at. And I think that uh, bigger businesses can learn from. Um, you know, I read a study that said that consumers will remember which companies behaved well during this pandemic, who was doing right by their people, who was doing right by the consumer. And so I think, you know, we have to be mindful of that and we have to remember that as well. So I think now is the time for, for people to really be examining their values um, on a consumer level, but also on a big business level. And I think you know, people like the ones I've mentioned, Bethany Williams and Tebe Magugo, I think they're really great shining examples of ways that you can um, engage with, with fashion, you know, as a creative director, or as a business owner, um, and it not be harmful and it, it can actually do good um, and really service communities. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And as you say, it's important to have a little bit of something that's a little bit upbeat. But I, I want to um, uh, go now to a question um, uh, from Solomon Noy, um, which um, concerns the extended producer responsibility. So Solomon Noy is the director of waste management in Accra, Ghana, the OR Foundation. And he asks, how can extended producer responsibility policies in the global north help prevent textile waste in secondhand markets such as Ghana, where many garments reach end of life. And um, I particularly wanted to ask this question because I think one of the sort of uh, um, uh, abiding images that I have in my mind from a visit to Benin was going to a huge market that was stacked high as far as the eye could see with our discarded clothing. So it's quite an important question here from uh, the Director of Waste Management in Accra. And I'm gonna ask uh, Mary to address this first off, and then I'll go to Dio. Well, I think there's a big crisis brewing in the entire waste industry um, here in the UK and globally, because markets are being disrupted and waste collections um, are being disrupted. So some, Councils are no longer collecting recyclables. Um, the ships aren't leaving um, to take that um, those recyclables to be reprocessed in China or to be burned in Sweden and uh, German energy from waste plants. And so the very, very small margins on which these 
um, markets operate are you know no longer going to help them make a profit so i think there's going to be a very big crisis in the waste industry um when we come out of this and nobody's talking about it but you can sort of see the beginnings of it and because it's not glamorous um it, and you know people don't want to think about where their stuff goes but the charity shops are closed so so all the stuff that people are currently like getting rid of outside you know in their houses there's nowhere there's nowhere for it to go so you either put it in the bin or you put it out on your wall or you leave it out in the street and hope someone comes and takes it if you're if you're able to do that um so i think the the, the waste system is is under huge stress i think also um the issue of brexit is going to be very difficult um for um the epr because um, we've got an environment bill that's supposed to be going through Parliament. I'm not sure if it's it's sort of got, you know, it's begun its second reading, but all of the legislation that we need for Brexit is going to be held up. And um, the issue around it potentially introducing an extended producer responsibility for textiles um, is at the very least going to be delayed. So the government was talking about 2022. Who knows now um, where that will end up and, and, and what you know whether that system will happen in a timely way so I, I think as we're looking at the onshoring and i just wanted to go back on the previous question and say you know the fashion industry has done amazing things when you think about the burberry workers in castleford desperate to make those gowns and ready to retool and ready to go and of course the problem is not their abilities it's the fact that you can't get the um high quality fabric that you need to keep medics safe in hospital because there's only one factory in the uk that makes it in scotland um so you know it's about what are we repurposing how are we doing things and i think um i met somebody when i was at a buildings conference who said look i'm, I'm working in sheffield i'm taking jeans you know end of life jeans scaggy old jeans and we're putting them in and we're making them into home insulation it's like well that's a brilliant brilliant sort of on you know onshore recycled carbon efficient energy efficient product and he was saying none of the banks will lend to me and this is you know this is lots of people are needed to do this work and i said well i'm not sure you should be going to the banks as a kind of commercial enterprise you want to be going to textile companies and big fashion brands and saying i'm taking your end of waste you know i'm i i can show that i've supported this company which is doing the right thing collecting um waste not offshoring it to ghana and other countries and putting it into people's homes and stopping people dying of the cold so how do we get carbon credits for those innovators that kenya was talking about and make sure that they're rewarded not through traditional finance because it, they're marginal models but we we put some green finance some carbon finance into those innovators so that they can build sustainable businesses as well. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive and interesting response to that. Dio, what about you? What do you think about this issue about waste management, particularly where it in involves dumping our old clothes in, in the developing world? Yeah, what I'm noticing is that uh, Mr. Wilson is actually talking about textile waste um, and, and how the textile waste is actually ending up in, uh, let's say, Ghana or, or Accra. And this textile waste is actually collected by, uh, you know, organizations who receive uh, funding from uh, government bodies like uh, SEDEX and Yellow Octopus and ICO Collective. These folks are collecting goods. They're actually filtering the good from that and sending on the things that they don't want to places where they feel uh, those who are less, uh, well, worthy should receive these garments. I think the question is really about good in and good out. You know, it's easy for us to talk about recycling and, and things of that nature, but you know, we recycle, we work with luxury brands, we take back their sold items, they're not, in, they're not all insinu uh, incinerating and, and, and burying their, their goods. Um, we actually take these goods back from them, we break them down through shredding, um, and, and but that being said, we can only break down um, good fabrics, not crap fabrics. And the crap actually ends up in these third world countries. So the question isn't really about, you know, China slowing down and not accepting uh, waste or, or, or the burning of, of, of garments or, or waste in, in Sweden or, or, or the like. It's really about starting in the right spot first. If you're, if you're creating a garment, you're starting with a quality garment that can be broken down, 
that we can then reweave into new fabrics because the fabric itself is quality. If it's not, then you're basically adding a filament yarn and this really small uh, broken down fibers and trying to make something amazing from it. And it just doesn't work. So it's, it's more beneficial for these, these groups like SEDEX and Yellow Octopus to send on the crap somewhere else. But, you know, obviously break down something that they can. Again, it's about quality in. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that, which turns out to be um, the last uh, response to, to the submitted questions. So I'd like to thank everybody who submitted a question today. It's been the most stimulating discussion. Obviously, there's a massive of, of work to do, and I don't think any of us are complacent about what the meaning of COVID-19 might turn out to be in relation uh, to the fashion industry. So lots to, to watch out for and do there. So I'd like to finish just by thanking my colleagues on the panel. That's Kate, Dio, Lisa, Mary and Kenya. Just give a little wave right now to say goodbye to everybody wherever they are. Happy afternoon, morning, noon or night. Thank you. Thank you all. Over to Mary now, I think. Over to me. I apologize if I'm going to be reading this. But um, I'm a little, always very nervous at um, Fashion Question Time. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming today. Um, and a thank you especially to the Fashion Revolution team. We're, we're too big now to thank all of us by name, but, but you are really thanked and I'm very grateful for all your hard work. So we've had so much today about the fundamental role we will all have to play post-COVID more than ever to avoid a humanitarian and environmental crisis. The current situation is highlighting the worst and the best in us at the same time. The worst is that our system values profits over people and mindless growth over sustainable prosperity. And this has never been so outrageously visible until now, until the canceled orders, the lost jobs and the total disregard for human suffering and safety. The best is in a few short months, we are seeing that nature has responded almost immediately, free from our onslaught. Pollution is down, fish are returning to the rivers and canals, big cities are quiet, no cars, no airplanes. We can all see the stars at night, even in London. Um, we are also seeing an increase in human empathy. And for me, most importantly, we are growing a generation of kids that have been somehow temporarily suspended from hero worshipping privileged celebrities and are getting to know the real heroes, the people, the doctors, the nurses, the carers, the public workers who save our lives or who make our lifestyles possible. We will have to look for balance after all this. Let's ensure that this period of restrictions won't be followed by one of hyper excesses of business as usual times 10. There are ways to make adequate amount of products, providing dignified work for the people who make them while protecting and conserving our environment. We have to invest in them and implement them with rigor. So the call for this fashion question time couldn't be more simple. Let's go back to the event's title, mass consumption, the end of an era, and remove the question mark. Mass consumption, the end of an era, full stop. Thank you.